Hello, everyone. I'd like to ask you a question. Hands up if you think social media is good for society. No takers? One, okay. An outlier. Interesting. Um, I think there's a big gap, isn't there, between the promise of social media and the reality, which is a shame because it has the capacity to do extraordinary things with our lives. But because of the way it's been designed and the way that we use it, it just tends to exacerbate the worst parts of the human condition. I think that's a shame. I think there's an alternative, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So let's look at what we know. We know that it deliberately and systematically steals our attention, meaning we're less present with other people. We know that the younger you are, the more time you're going to spend on it, and that 200 million people globally are addicted. <laughs> we know that heavy users are more prone to anxiety and depression and feelings of dissatisfaction with their lives as they compare themselves to the unrealistic and curated lives of their friends and, more importantly, influencers. And that influencer relationship is kind of strange, isn't it? You know, they invite you into their lives, they show you around a bit, maybe show you a product or two, hook you to a success narrative like health or wealth or beauty or celebrity, you invest time, and all the while, they have absolutely no idea who you are. You see, I don't know if you're aware of this, but people in the West right now are experiencing an epidemic of loneliness where one in five millennials say they don't have a single friend. And then there's a the content. For every cute kitten video or nice piece of culture, there's someone trying to sell you something. And from there, it just gets worse. Hate speech, cyberbullying, and organized crime, all insulated by anonymity. And there's no doubt, is there, that we treat each other differently online to how we treat each other offline. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. I think the first is there are no consequences for antisocial behavior. But the second is more complex. It's to do with the fact that when you're speaking to someone in a normal conversation, those interpersonal cues are there, they're absent online. So we're slightly disconnected, aren't we? Slightly disinhibited. And the problem is that can lead to dehumanization. And then, of course, there is a gargantuan amount of bad information on social media. There's disinformation, which is, you know, probably paid for, and that's the deliberate stuff. And then there's misinformation, which is the majority, which is us just passing along to someone else thinking it's true. The problem with this, of course, is it gives us a really impoverished idea of the world that we live in and makes decision-making very difficult. You know, there is a term in philosophy called naive realism, which is a tendency to believe that our perception of the world reflects it exactly as it is. So what you really have is hundreds of millions of people with a smartphone thinking that the world they're seeing through their screen is accurate. And of course, you add in millions and millions of fake accounts disseminating millions of false narratives, and you can see we're in quite a lot of trouble. Countries are becoming more and more ungovernable. Democracy is weakening. Institutions are less effective, experts are less respected, and of course, political violence is on the rise. And all of this at a time when the world is literally riddled with systemic problems that need our attention. However, I think that social media can be the key that unlocks an incredible future, but not if it stays in the condition that it's in. It has to change. If it doesn't, I think things are going to get worse. So let me tell you what I mean. I think that social media needs to be human-focused. And it needs to focus like a laser on the integrity of the content and the information that we get, which basically means we need to dial down 
information that hijacks our emotions and dial up information that is interesting and factual and evidence-based, but most importantly, information that shows us the world as it is. Because once you can do that, once everyone shares some kind of commonality, then amazing things happen. We have more trust. We have more understanding. We have more respect. With respect comes cooperation, sharing of plans, the sort of merging of values. And then you have more cooperation. And with cooperation, you start getting things done. That's got to be the goal. That's the promise of social media. However, the business model currently is standing in the way. This is how it goes. Advertisers, who are the clients, they want us to look at content. They want our attention. So the social networks program the algorithms to send us stuff that gets our attention. The problem is that the things that really get our attention are threats and opportunities. And of course, a lot of people are scrolling multiple times a day. So you have a scenario where people are getting multiple threats and opportunities on their phones because that makes the best material for the advertisers. It's going to make you quite anxious, isn't it? And in addition to that, another fascinating feature of the human mind is we are programmed to find patterns. And of course, when you're really stressed, that programming gets enhanced. And when that gets enhanced, that's called apophenia, by the way. And sometimes, you're going to get content that alleviates that stress and helps the world to make sense. The problem is, often, that content is completely bogus, completely untrue. And then you're dealing with something called a conspiracy theory. Worse, people fuel conspiracy theories through the research that they're doing. Ever met someone, maybe you're having a conversation where Someone will say to you, oh, you know, Bill Gates, he's, uh, he's trying to inject us with microchips, uh, blah, blah, blah. And you're going, I'm, I'm sure that's not true. And they'll say, oh, no, no, I've done my research. You should educate yourself. I tend to uh, step back from those kind of conversations and literally say, you know what, I defer to experts because that's what they're for. Because they're not, they're not perfect experts, but at least they use a scientific method, at least they are scrutinized by their peers, and at least they are held to account. But another problem arises. I mean, I don't think social media does anything other than undermine expertise. But unfortunately, you're going to get a situation where you have, maybe let's say I want to understand about the climate crisis. I want to hear from a climate scientist, don't I? Let's call him Colin. But unfortunately, there's also someone else on social media. He's a dentist, and he's called Dave. Now, Colin's been doing it for 32 years. He's an absolute expert, loves the data, but he's quite dull. Dave, on the other hand, has a really cool Instagram account, a TikTok. He drives a Lamborghini. He's very cool, very charismatic, and he's extremely persuasive. Sadly, sometimes Dave wins out over Colin. And that is a tragedy of worldly proportions. So if we are finding it difficult to understand things, our attention is waning, and our communication is substandard, what are we going to do about it? Well, I think we need to look to ourselves. It's very easy to point the finger at the tech companies, but we need to take some personal responsibility. I think the first thing we need to understand is that we are animals and that our thinking is flawed and hasn't really caught up with the modern world, and that we are staggeringly easy to manipulate. And if we could just understand this, maybe, just have a, a shred of intellectual humility, then perhaps we could change direction. I mean, think about it. You know, our emotions, we know, are much more powerful than our logical mind. And social media feeds our biases and actually rewards us for feeling the way that we do. And of course, when that happens, we start to feel 
certain, which sounds good. Don't you love to feel a little bit certain? I know I do. But the problem is, you see, because the world's scary, right, and random and confusing and chaotic, and certainty makes you feel safe. The problem with certainty is that as soon as you're certain, you stop thinking. And of course, sometimes when you find people who share your certainty, maybe in a group, and you start to feel safe and are maybe a little more powerful, then you might be motivated to believe things that are in your interests and the interests of the group. And you might start to be suspicious of other people who maybe see the world differently to you. Maybe their algorithm sends them different information. You can see where I'm going with this. And then eventually, when push comes to shove, you find very good people doing some rather bad things because lots of other people are doing it. That could al almost, almost be a little recipe for societal breakdown. You see, in lots of ways, the term social media is a misnomer. In reality, it should be called tribal media because it exploits our need to belong. And social media does this at scale because it's designed to. So I hope you'll agree with me right now that we are experiencing what can only be termed as a communication crisis that's being fueled by social media. So what to do? I think there is one word that will change the direction of travel dramatically, and that word is accountability. You see, as soon as you say that, somebody will say, but what about my freedom? You're coming after my freedom. And actually, I would say it's the opposite. You've got that backwards. I think freedom is the cornerstone, the cornerstone of a high-functioning society. However, online, people misunderstand what freedom means. Online, it's quite simple. You'll hear people say things like total free speech. But freedom for everyone is not total free speech. Freedom is a two-way street. Freedom is freedom to do stuff like Freedom of speech, freedom of movement, absolutely. But it's also freedom from stuff. Things like freedom from violence, freedom from disinformation, freedom from exploitation. You see, I don't think you can have real freedom without real accountability. Because think about it. In the beginning, and I'm only going back 40 years, in the beginning, there was the personal computer. It was a bit of a free-for-all. Then the internet came along, and it was really exciting. And all the kind of weird stuff, the bad stuff, was kind of squirreled away in, in strange parts of the internet. But then social media came along 20 years ago and we could start sharing. That was fun. And then the smartphone came along in 2007 and that sort of turbocharged the ability to share and we had it all coming to our, to our fingertips. And everyone thought, this is great, this is a revolution, this is exciting. But unfortunately, then the data started to come in over the last 10 years and psychologists and health professionals started to realize that young people were starting to suffer. There was a little more self-harm, a little more thoughts of suicide. There were people disappearing down rabbit holes, never to be seen again. There were people being radicalized. So governments tried to catch up and they started to legislate, but by that time, the advertisers had muscled in. And so our friends at the social networks were slow. Slow to do anything about it but slow, importantly, to be accountable. So what should we do? Here are four things I would do now, actually yesterday, if we're gonna change the direction of travel. Number one, the first thing I would do is change the business model. A lot of people in Silicon Valley are suggesting this already, but obviously there's resistance. We have to have a space that does not exploit people, that is psychologically safe and encourages people to work together. That's not going to happen with the current model, and there are other models available. The second thing I would do, we have to treat information as sacrosanct. We cannot have a situation where we, people talk about you know, the ecology of the environment. What about the ecology of our information? It needs to be better, and that can be changed with changes in the algorithm, changes in design, and more moderation. The third thing I would do is user identification. That's a big one for a lot of libertarians, but I think it's absolutely essential, because we, we have to be accountable to one another. You know, if you want to stop cybercrime, you want to stop misinformation bots, and you want to stop a lot of cyberbullying, Knowing who you're speaking to 
is kind of helpful. Now, I'm not suggesting people can't have avatars, that's fine. But there is software now that can identify that you are a real person, a real person without telling the social network. So it's, it's possible that technology is here. And then the last thing that I would do, and this I think gets to the bottom of the kind of the malaise that I feel, I know a lot, uh, people of maybe my generation share that things are sort of slightly spinning out of control. We have to understand that as a society, we need a sort of universal upskilling. And the reason for this is the Internet of Things, which I consider to be humankind's greatest invention, along with social media, unfortunately, it has awesome power. And it is an absolute treasure trove, but it's also quite dangerous. It's like Pandora's box, a modern Pandora's box. The problem with that is we don't necessarily have the skills, the tools, to cope and to manage it, either emotionally or intellectually. So I would be, if I was the Prime Minister, I would try and be a little bit more like Finland. Because in 2016, Finland introduced critical thinking skills and media literacy into the curriculum. And now Finland sits way out on top of the media literacy index, way out ahead of everybody else, and their citizens are best able to spot and manage fake news. Now think what that does for a society. More cohesion, more trust in journalists, more trust in scientists, more freedom, if you will. See, that's a modern solution to a modern problem and something that I'm sure will be very popular with the general public. But I'm not holding my breath that social networks will necessarily do anything. So if that doesn't happen, there is one final alternative which I will leave you with. Somewhere out there, there is a bright spark who's already building a new social network, Some, someone that implements all of the reforms I've just suggested as standard. They'll get rid of likes and follows because they see them as toxic, and instead they want to create a collaborative, action-based environment where young people especially feel safe and have the joy, the understanding, and the will to collaborate with one another. That's how you change the world. And you know what? I think this platform is just around the corner. Thanks very much.